What's going on everybody? Welcome back to 909 Adventures. Uh, we're doing something pretty cool today. A haunted tour of Whittier, California. This is pretty cool. I don't know what to expect, but um, supposedly this is pretty cool. Uh, I don't want to waste too much time talking about it. Let's just dive right into this video. I just want to point out really quick, I am not showing you guys the entire tour in this video the entire tour took about two hours and you guys are getting the short and sweet version of it uh, it's about 45 minutes so um, i hope you guys enjoy this i also want to give a quick shout out to our friend rain for sponsoring this video thank you so much rain if you're watching um, i hope you guys enjoy this video if you hear any squawking we have a snow white owl who lives in the park i call him hedgewig um, he, sometimes he's just this like ball of white and he just kind of bursts over us. So we might get lucky and see him tonight. Without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I like to ask every one of my tours um, a pretty basic question. And there's not a wrong answer to this. Why is it we tell ghost stories? Any thoughts on that? Like I said, not a wrong answer. Well, the ambiance? The ambiance, that, that's great. We love sitting around the campfire, right? Yeah. Telling ghost stories, nothing better. Especially in the high desert, it gets right. spooky out there. Yes, it does. Anybody else? Like to be scared. We like to be scared. That's why we watch the horror movies, right? That's why they're popular. There he is. There he is. Oh, there he goes. Yeah, they're lucky tonight. Did you get he showed it? himself. Yeah. He's going to All right, I like that one too. Now, one of my interests is in sharing my tour with you is that I think ghost stories are a way, great way of teaching history. Mm. Um, it is a way for us to remember those that came before. Mm. So as I tell you these stories, think about what they're teaching and how they hearken back to those that came before us. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of people have come through Whittier. Um, a lot of people don't even realize how historic our land is. Uh, the tongue of the Indians, this was their home. They were here. After that 18th century, the Spaniards, they start showing up here. They had ranches here. Can you picture that? Spaniards, the guys with the helmets and the spears. Long time ago, they were here. The Mexicans, they start showing up here. And then they were like... Well, <laughs> well, actually, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've actually got some great stories about some of the early Mexican settlers that were here. We'll kind of get into that. Um, but then after that, uh, the Civil War, you have the... Um, Quakers, they start showing up and they kind of settle our town. And you know, we're here today, and each of these groups have left parts of themselves here, and uh, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Now, my very first story for you guys, this is kind of my warm-up story, so we're gonna we're gonna warm you guys up with a good one. Um, this came to me directly from um, the curator of the Whittier Museum. It's an interesting story because it was somebody who needed help that came down there. And what happened was, is there was a young lady, and she was around 18 years of age, and she was going to be a student at Whittier College. Now, how many people here have had the experience of being young and living completely by yourself? Have any of you here done that? Okay, is it spooky? A little bit for the first little time, a little bit of time. Kind of, right? It's good life. So this young lady, mom and dad came and helped her move in, and they set everything up, you know, up the way she wanted it. Then they said goodbye. See you later. And the door closes, and she's sitting in her living room, and suddenly there's the realization that she is by herself. And there was something unsettling about that. And as she was kind of contemplating on this, she heard some pots and pans move around in the kitchen. And she thought, well, maybe they were settling. Maybe, you know, her parents had maybe set them up a certain way and they, they fell. But one of them, it sounded like a pan slid across the countertop. So she thought that was odd. She got up to check things. And sure enough, that's exactly what had happened. Uh, she actually called her mother. This frightened her a little bit. Mom said, look, you need to get used to being on your own. These things happen. You're fine. A couple weeks go by. She's sitting there uh, on her bed doing some homework and she starts hearing scratching. And the scratching is, um, it's moving around. Um, she can hear it in the ceiling, uh, inside, in, inside the wall, and it, it's as if somebody's taking their fingernails and just digging like that. Now, 
she's kind of thinking this is probably rodents, right? Isn't that the most logical explanation? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so she uh, she calls the superintendent. She explains what has happened. The superintendent says, no, 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 you're fine. Um, we, we, we don't have rats in the building. We trap them. We, we do what we need to do with exterminators. But she's not convinced. Um, she does tell her parents about this. Once again, they say the most logical explanation is rodents. But then a couple weeks go by. She's kind of forgotten a little bit about this, tried to put it to the, uh, the back of her mind. And then she starts hearing voices. Now, it is clearly a woman's voice. It's whispering. And it's usually as she is trying to go to sleep at night, sometimes early in the morning. She can't quite make out the words, but it's clear a woman's voice, just low enough that she can't make out what the words are. This is very unsettling to her, but she's trying to just kind of plow through it and just kind of put it to the back of her mind. Something is trying to communicate with this lady and she doesn't realize it. Now this is the one story that I can tell you that it happened on a dark and stormy night. She wakes up at two in the morning. The rain is pounding. She doesn't know why she wakes up, but she does. She sits up in bed and there is something at the foot of her bed. There is a woman standing there, a woman in 19th century clothing. She is clearly of Japanese descent. She can see her face. This woman looks to be Japanese, but she, the hair, kind of like the grudge, the long black hair, and the woman's jaw drops in a scream. And as they make eye contact, she fades from view as if she had never been there. Now, this was enough for this poor young lady. She calls her mother and says, look, I can't stay in this house any longer. She goes home and her mom says, okay, I, well, let's go to the Whittier Museum. Maybe they can tell us something about the building. Well, the building's from the 1970s. It's not particularly old. Why is this 19th century Japanese woman in her house? Well, they, the Whittier Museum is helpful. They get out the map and they, they kind of look at where the address is. They say, oh, right there. That land used to be the old Leppingwell Ranch. Leppingwell Ranch, what was that? Well, they had citrus, they had walnuts, they had a number of different types of items that were growing here in Whittier at the time. And back in the early 1900s, they brought over Japanese immigrants to pick the fruit. And they allowed them to build little villages on the land, places where they could live and they could sleep. And when there were accidents, or if some of them died of diseases, guess what? They were buried right there on the ranch. Now, tradition of the time, they would build, you know, maybe a, uh, a wooden uh, marker to show where they had been buried. But what happens to wood over time? It rots away. So then, the graves were forgotten. The land in the 1950s and 60s was divided up and sold. And we think that the apartment complex there was built over the grave of, the, of the, this poor Japanese woman. And what we do believe is that she reappears every now and again to let people know that she is still buried there and that she did in fact exist. Um, when I first heard this story, that was the only appearance of her that I had heard. Um, I have had people contact me recently that uh, say that they have seen her outside the building, even standing in the middle of Leppingwell Road. Uh, usually at night when somebody's gone, she's gone. So she's definitely a very active spirit. There's your warm-up story. Do you feel warmed up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we take a walk? Let's do it. All right, follow me. I'm going to show you guys a fun picture right here. We have a few places in Whittier where you can stand and you can see the, the area. Um, that has not changed a whole lot since maybe the 1930s or the 40s. And this is one of those spots. You kind of see our, uh, our Art Deco police or postal building right behind us, the post office. You see it in the back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we have a lot of elements that are kind of, uh, in a way, ghosts of the past. So if you saw a big ring in the ground outside an old house here in Whittier, what would that ring be for? Any ideas? I'm sorry, what? No? Horses, that's right. People used to ride their horses up and down here. 
Now here's a fun one. Big old piece of iron set into the ground at an angle by the door. What's that for? All the houses here have them. That's right, it's a boot scraper, right? Because we had horses here, the roads were not paved, so the mud and the horses, you wanted to clean your boots off before you went on those beautiful hardwood floors, right? All right, now the next story I'm gonna tell you came to me from another college student. Um, this, actually, he's much older now. Uh, he's I mean, in his 60s, but this happened to him when he was a young man. I did not go to a public school. We're all good. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he was going to Rio Hondo College. If you guys, I'm sure everybody here knows where that is. It's just down the road here a little bit. And he was returning home uh, very late at night. He was working on a production. And it was probably around 11 o'clock. It might have been a little later than that. But he was driving by Founders Park. And Founders Park is that direction. It's probably about 10 minutes from here. And as he was driving by Founders Park, he noticed that there was a commotion. Uh, there was something in the park. And so he slowed down and he saw a hearse, a horse-drawn hearse, just sitting there smack in the middle of the park. And there was a coachman, the guy had a top hat on, he was holding a whip. There were two men in the back. Uh, they appeared to have very grubby overalls. Um, they were struggling to pull a coffin out of the back of this hearse. Now, this gentleman is not thinking of anything supernatural whatsoever. He believes he's seen a uh, film being produced. And he's interested in that being a college student. So he kind of slows his car down to look a little better, but he's noticing there's no cameras, there's no director. It's just this hearse. And he gets a chill down the back of his spine and he realizes he's probably seen something that he doesn't want to see, and he drives off. But after a couple minutes later, the rationale kicks in. It's like, there's no way I saw that. So he turns around and heads back to the park. Now it's empty, completely bathed in the moonlight of the full moon, but there's no hearse there. Now he rapidly drives home, and he wakes his roommate up, explains what has happened. The roommate just smiles and says, you don't know our history. You see, Founders Park has another name. My Whittier people, what do we call Founders Park? Come on, you guys are quiet. Come on, anybody know? Dead Man's Park. Dead Man's Park, that's right. Because it is our first cemetery. And here's the photo from 1913. Now, how many people here knew that Founders Park used to be a cemetery? Okay, you guys did, anybody else? Have you guys been to Founders Park before? Now, a lot of people on my tour, especially people who grew up in Whittier, do in fact know that Founders Park is a cemetery. What they do not know is the rest of the story. <laughs> and that's what we're gonna get into. Way back in the 1870s, we had a diphtheria outbreak in this area. It was bad. People were dying left, right, and sideways. Now, I already talked to you guys about burial traditions in that time. You oftentimes would bury your loved one right there on your ranch, but there were a lot of people dying, and they realized our little community here needs its own cemetery. So the Dorland family, they stepped forward. They had a big ranch, and they said, look, we're cabinet makers. We don't need the ranch. We're gonna become the undertakers, turn our land into a cemetery. Now, why was that a good fit for them? They were cabinet makers. They, could make, they could make the coffins. Yeah, you're putting it together. And so they did so. Uh, they, uh, they were basically our undertakers here in the town, our first ones for many, many years. Uh, then they slowly died off. The last of them died in 1940. And this picture always makes people laugh. This was the last of the Dorlin. Her name is Archelissa. And she does, in fact, hang out in Founders Park, but we'll get to that in a minute. Isn't she the stereotype of a female undertaker? Oh. If you were thinking female 19th century undertaker, this might be what you would think. Don't you like her hair? <laughs> so she was, she was a character, wasn't she? So she dies, and now nobody is left to take care of the old cemetery. So the grass starts growing tall, the tombstones start leaning over. It was a very spooky looking place. But then the vandals start showing up 
and unfortunately they started breaking down the tombstones. The owl agrees. I was upset by it too. So the city declares the cemetery to be a public nuisance. You can't have that. So they put out a memo to our residents. If you have a loved one buried in Founders Park, we will move them free of charge to the big cemetery at Rose Hills. Do you want to know how many people took advantage of that? No. Actually, it was between six and eight. Can you believe it? I wish it was 13. <laughs> the better, better story. Um, so what happened was, is they did move those bodies, but they left everybody else there. They just moved the tombstones. If you wanted a tombstone, believe it or not, you could just go and take one. Some people did. Uh, the Whittier Museum has a few of them, a couple of them over at Pio Pico's Mansion, but the rest of them were, some of them were even destroyed. Um, there was a guy a couple of doors down from me when I was growing up, he had one on his porch. We thought that guy was spooky. Kind of rode our bikes very slowly by that guy's house. It was just a little spooky. Uh, but the bodies were all left there, and it is in fact the most haunted place here in Whittier. Um, we do get a lot of apparitions there. People that live around the park hear the giggling and laughter of small children. Uh, we know that a lot of the victims of the diphtheria outbreak were in fact children, and they're still there playing, uh, usually late at night. People will hear that giggling and the laughter, and it's just the children having a good time after some hundred years. Um, Art Talissa also walks around. She ha carries a red rose with her. Why does she have a red rose? The only thing that I can think of is that because she did take care of the park, of the cemetery while she was alive, maybe if she's putting flowers on graves, we don't know, uh, but she's a, a frequently seen apparition there. And what is interesting is I had a guy on my tour, this was maybe a year ago, and he's standing kind of where you guys are, and he was shaking his head as I was telling this story. And I said, am I getting something wrong? And he said, no, no, no. He's like, I drive by there on my way back from work, and I see a woman with a red rose standing there, all in black, and I just thought she was some weird goth chick. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> I don't think so. And uh, he said he wasn't gonna drive by the park anymore after that. So that is Founders Park. Now, you can go there if you want. You can take pictures if you want. You might get little orbs of light. Sometimes we get shadow people. But at the end of my tour, I'm gonna tell you why that's a really bad idea. But that's your bedtime story. Now, we are going to make a cross over to the old post office. Um, just be careful as we cross the street. This was uh, one of the very first haunted locations here in Whittier that I was able to scout out. And um, I had heard uh, a lot of rumors that people believed it was haunted. I figured the best way to get that information was to actually talk to somebody that worked in the building. And I happened to run in, literally I was on my way here and there was a, uh, a postal worker that was going this direction. And I stopped him and I didn't even say anything about ghosts. I said, you know, tell me about the old building that you work in. And he's like, oh, well, the place is haunted. Just like that. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, there's a belief among some people that when a building is very important to somebody in their lives, like they spend a lot of time in it, um, that sometimes they just kind of stick around. Um, maybe it was just where they were happiest. I don't know why working in a postal uh, post office, but maybe that was their thing. And um, and what he shared with me is that he's like, just weird things happen. He said, knickknacks will disappear on somebody's desk, and and then they'll reappear a couple weeks later. You go out to lunch, you leave a stack of letters on your desk, you come back and they're fanned out. And another person share with me that like sometimes you get touched here, and nothing like overly inappropriate, just a very cold hand on your shoulder or maybe in the small of your back trying to move you forward. And maybe it's the former employees from many, many years ago. Um, we've been on the tour, we've had people see faces uh, very quickly or kind of glimpses of things in the window. So maybe you get lucky tonight. And depends on how you define luck, right? Um, some people see a gentleman in 1940s era clothing uh, from what the way he's been described to me as a double-breasted jacket and a fedora hat. And he's just on the other side of the glass there waves like he needs help he's like motioning to them and when they cross the street he's just not there anymore he's just gone 
Now I'm going to share with you my favorite story. And uh, I have heard that there is a spirit in the basement that is not quite as nice. These other ones are okay, but this one is a little more grumpy. And there was a manager here, and I believe this was in the early 1980s, and he had heard that it was haunted when he, when he came to manage the building. Uh, did not believe the stories, uh, was not a uh, believer in spirits and ghosts, and had even gone as far to tell the employees that I believe the odd happenings here are the result of employees playing tricks on one another. If I catch you, you will be written up. He is in the building by himself early one morning and he hears movement coming from the basement area so he decides he's going to go and and figure out what's going on he thinks an employee has is not in the building when he should be and as he makes his way over there the door literally slams shut behind him now they had there was a light one of those little hanging lights and he's trying to turn it on and it will not turn on and now he's getting a little spooked and he feels this ice cold wind just breeze through him, chilling him to the bone. And then he hears a voice right in his ear, get out. Apparently he turns around and just tears out of the building. Um, I heard it was rather undignified. And uh, the story is, is that he went home and asked for a transfer to another building saying that he did not wish to spend any more time in this particular post office. So as we leave, if anybody sees anything interesting, do let the rest of us know. Um, this is the Barclay Charles house. Um, in Whittier history, um, this is kind of an important house. It's not our oldest standing structure, but it is one of them. Uh, Mr. Barclay Charles, who's this guy? Well, he was a Civil War veteran. Well, not entirely. Um, I looked up his service record. We know that he was the bugler in the 7th Iowa Cavalry. So he's the guy on horseback that sounds charge, but they didn't send him to fight the rebels. He actually was sent out west to fight the Indians. Uh, he was in some very, very big battles. Uh, when the war was over, he came out here to California. This was the land of opportunity. So uh, he came out here, he purchased all of the land that we're standing on right here. All of this was owned by Mr. Barclay Charles. He purchased that land from a guy by the name of Pio Pico. Now who's he? Who's he, Pio Pico? Last Mexican governor of California. So who, you were my friend that said the Mexicans had never left, right? So he, he's one of them. He, he was our Mexican governor, um, and he had, but he became a very wealthy man after um, the sovereignty was passed from Mexico to the United States. In fact, at one point, he was our wealth, most wealthy citizen. But later in life, he had a gambling problem and he was unfortunately forced to sell off a lot of his land holdings, including where we're standing now, and Barclay Charles purchased it. Now, he built that beautiful home, and he built the house next door to it, and he lived there all the way to 1930. And the reason he stopped living there was because his wife, Sarah, died. She died in that upper window. That, that was the room that, where she died. And Barclay, he couldn't take care of himself anymore, so he moves in with his family, his children, in Los Angeles. But Sarah was left behind. The spirit stuck around. Now, this is the good story. She has been seen a number of times. She sometimes appears in those windows. People in the park at night have seen a woman in white just standing there looking over to what used to be her orange grove. Uh, there's a lady and she's not here right now, but she likes to sit on that bench over there. Uh, she has shared with me that she's actually seen her in the middle of the night. She sometimes comes out and rests here and has seen her standing there and then she disappears. But the guy next door has the best story. When he moved into that house, he had settled his kids to bed and this was the first night they were living there and the kids come tearing downstairs going, dad, 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 there is this mean old lady in the other house and she's staring through the window into our bedroom. And um, he says, there's nobody up there. In fact, I know that I met the people next door, there's no old lady, but they had seen this woman and they were very afraid of her. This went on for several weeks to the point they were waking him up in the middle of the night. And one day the kids were gone, they were staying with grandma and grandpa, and he was bent over picking up some toys. Now, have you ever had that experience where you feel eyes on the back of your head. You know what I mean? 
somebody is watching you? Well, he had that feeling. So he gets up, slowly turns to Bama. There she is standing there. He was very, he was kind of taken back, started breathing hard, and she didn't disappear. She stayed there staring at him. Uh, he ran downstairs, started breathing hard, realizing the kids had been telling the truth. He had to have a solution to this problem. Do you want to know what his solution was? Curtains. <laughs> he said drapes, but, <laughs> but yeah, he had to put curtains up because he didn't want the kids looking over there anymore. Uh, a lot of people ask me, why, why is she angry? Why is she in the window? Um, my only thoughts on that is when she deceased, when she died, her husband left. She was left behind. And I think she was very bothered by that, maybe even confused. And so she's still there and probably just a little frustrated because she doesn't understand the situation. Now, there could be some other spirits in this house, too. Um, I do know that the door jiggles by itself occasionally. Um, I talked to one person that was going to visit the residence, and they weren't there, and they stood there, and they watched the doorknob jiggle, and they thought maybe somebody was on the other side, and the door was stuck, so they went down to grab it, and it was ice cold. Now, you asked me about what I've seen. The owner of that house, when he first moved in, he went down, he went under the porch, he found a child-sized rocking chair. Guess what he did with it? He brought it inside. You know where this is going, right? So in the middle of the night, it started rocking. Um, so he put it on the porch and um, on the tour, we actually have seen it rock back and forth. Um, he put it back under the porch where it belongs. However, if you do come back in October, he do, will bring it out and he does have it sitting on the porch and you might even get lucky and see it rock all by itself. No, you're not coming back, are you? <laughs> yes. All right, let's, let's go ahead and take a walk. Now, before we go, there's one thing I want to point out to you. you. See the house with the weather vane on it? Right over there? That is the Sharpless house. I don't have any good stories about it being haunted. However, the Sharpless family, their boys were best friends with somebody whose name you might be familiar with, a guy by the name of Richard Nixon. Uh, when he was a boy, he used to play over there. He would have dinner there. When he got older and was going to college and he was in law school, he rented the room out the back. And so he, uh, this was a place that he did spend time. And I do like to point out to people that um, it is kind of cool that an American president spent, um, you know, this is where he was, he was kind of raised and where he spent time. Now, a lot of people know about Richard, but you know our other presidential connection? We have one more. Anybody know? Lou Hoover, Herbert Hoover's wife. Uh, we have an elementary school named after her and she grew up in this area. Interesting fact about her, very good horseback rider. In fact, she was better than a lot of the men. And she used to like to challenge some of our local cowboys to a race, and she would oftentimes beat them. So, just kind of some fun Whittier history for you. <laughs> All right, now, those of you that are on Whitt uh, from Whittier know that no ghost tour could possibly be complete unless we spent some time talking about Trumbull Canyon. Mm. Yeah, that's the one you guys are all waiting for, right? If you're not from Whittier, we will enlighten you about Turnbull Canyon. Um, Turnbull Canyon is the canyon that goes back that direction. The reason that I stop here, I have a couple reasons. This is kind of the gateway to it, so if you drive that way, you make a right, head, you'll, you'll head right into Turnbull Canyon. Um, but why is the canyon haunted? Well, there's a lot of folklore about it. There's a lot of people have different beliefs on why it is haunted. We do know the Tongva Indians believed that it was kind of an area where the spirits would dwell. So that might be the origins of it. But I think it goes back more, a little bit more recent than that. And we know that um, uh, Getty Oil and there were a couple of other oil companies that were drilling for oil back there. Now, in that era, we do know that they didn't have a lot of safety precautions, right? We also know a lot of people died drilling oil back there. I think it was a dangerous place. Um, sometimes the oil rigs would catch the ground on fire. People would die that way. So I think it got a reputation as a very dangerous place. A lot of people died, and I think those spirits have stuck around. And we'll get a little bit more into that, but it is a place of death. Now, we stopped here for my other reason is because we're by an airplane. The airplanes fly over this area. Way back in 1954, there was an airplane, and he was making his way with 29 souls on board 
from New York City to Los Angeles. And there was one Whittier resident on board. Ironically, she was returning from a funeral. You'll see why that's ironic. When they got to this area, it was foggy. And the pilot, very experienced pilot, might I add, old World War II veteran, so he had flown in some pretty bad places. And he contacted the tower. He told them, it's foggy. I think I know where I am. So they were looking at the maps. The instruments weren't as good back then. And they both decided together that the plane was just right where it needed to be. Go ahead and put your landing gear down. You can start to descend. He didn't realize that he was slightly off track. The plane had been lowering and lowering. He put the wheels down, and you know what happened? He was right above Turnbull Canyon. The plane smacked into the canyon, rolled over several times, and smashed into the canyon floor. Obviously, all 29 people died. Now, when that happened, where we're standing, the earth shook. What did people think? Earthquake. Earthquake, right? It's California. Some of them would have run out of their homes, and they would have looked back that way, and they would have seen smoke billowing out of the canyon into a mushroom cloud. What is? What are they thinking next? Bomb. It's 1954, right? Yeah, nuclear war, right? Mm -hmm. So that was probably a very scary experience for them. And when it didn't spread and everybody didn't die in Whittier, they realized that it was probably an airplane. So there were some men that jumped on horseback, rode back into the canyon, and this is what they saw. Prince two. They would say that this was worse than what they saw in the war. Apparently the bodies were quite mangled, so you can imagine how disturbing that would be. This is something I found just kind of digging around. This is that's one of the bodies being removed. Um, you don't oh, see anything. Yeah, you don't see anything gory here, but you know you can figure out what's going on. Yeah. No, you're like. Oh, did it just go out? Yeah. It's the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> now, would it surprise you if I told you that there had been people? Scene. You guys like vintage Halloween movies? Oh yeah. yeah. Hey, do we have some favorites here? I want to hear them. Any favorites? Okay, that's 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 the big one. You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> so way back in the ancient 1990s, there was a lovely movie called Hocus Pocus that came out. Um, who are the Sanderson sisters? Smart guy. Sarah, Winifred, and. Oh, you even know their names. Yeah, we were talking about it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> but they're witches, right? Yeah. And but they're not regular witches. Where are they from? Yeah. They're Salem, so they're, they're kind of cooler than regular witches. They're Salem witches. And in the movie, um, as you know, they show up in modern Salem, and they're a little confused by our traditions of Halloween, and there is a hilarious scene where they uh, run into a gentleman dressed as the devil, and we all know that they bow down and call him master, and that is the devil's house right there. Right there, and uh, that picket bench right there, that's where they, they step their... Um, their brooms, uh, and that whole scene was filmed out there. Um, that is, in fact, the Adams house, which is kind of ironic. Um, back when that movie was being made, I have a small connection to it. Um, I happened to be here at the park the day they were shooting, and I was sitting right there, and I was just kind of looking over the sets because they only had the houses closed off. They actually, the park was still open. And um, a, a woman walked up to me and she had a clipboard and she pointed at me and said, Sir, would you like to be in the movies? And I just smiled and said, This is how it happens in California. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I signed some papers and she brings over this whole film crew and they filmed me in front of the home and walking up and down. And if you watch that movie really carefully, you will not see me in it. <laughs> Cutting room floor. But 100% true. Um, we do film a heck of a lot of movies here. Um, if you are interested in Hocus Pocus, although that scene was filmed in front of the house <clears throat> when they were invited inside the home, that was filmed inside the White Emerson place that's right over there. All of these homes are in the movie, so please do watch it, and I think you will enjoy that. Um, does anybody know some of the other movies that we filmed here in Whittier? Yeah. Disturbia. Disturbia. Right there. What, you got another no, one? I'm saying the disturbing yeah, that's the most famous one. More recently, uh, do you know that we have one that's even more recent than that? Have you seen the Fable Men with Steven about the mm -hmm. Steven Spielberg biopic? Mm -hmm. so for some reason, Whittier doubles as Mesa, Arizona. <laughs> um, the cowgirl house that we stopped by, uh, that was Amanda Bynes' grandmother's house in the movie Liar Liar with Jim Carrey. Um, and 
does anybody know our most famous movie that was filmed here in Whittier? Back huge pop culture 80s Back movie. Back to the Future. Back to the Future. Oh. Um, a couple of different uh, things here um, in this t city, including Whittier High School, which was Marty McFly's high school as well. Um, and the guys always get this one. The girls don't necessarily. Sometimes they do. Yeah. Big pop culture 80s movie. Superhero movie. Masters of the Universe? That's right. Greenleaf. That was on Greenleaf. Yeah, this guy, man, he knows his stuff. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if anybody's seen uh, Matilda with Danny DeVito um, mm -hmm. over Lucerna High School. It was filmed right over by Lucerna High School. So, um, so definitely go check those movies out and you can see a little bit more of Whittier. Um, so that is the old Red Cross building. Um, it has been defunct since um, 2016. Uh, before that, it was the Women's Club. Uh, it opened in the 1930s. Um, it's women's club back in those days. We had a lot of philanthropic organizations, including that one. Uh, they basically existed to help the community in any way that they could. Um, but the, the building has kind of a tragic history. Um, we do know that they um, they have they have a stage in there, and they did have a lot of productions. And there was a uh, an actress that a man fell in love with, and she spurred his advances. And apparently he was very persistent, and she was very persistent that she was not interested. And one day, uh, the owners of the building came in, and he was found hanging from the rafters. Uh, he is one of the spirits that does haunt that building, and we think he's a little bit angry. Um, I talked to a uh, security guard who was leading, leaving the building one day, and I asked him if he had had any experiences. And he said, well, he said, whatever is in there is lonely. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, as I go through the building, I have my flashlight up like this and my hand in my pocket. And I said, okay. He said, well, I used to walk with my hand behind my back until whatever is in there tried to hold hands with me. He said it was ice cold and that was enough for him. Uh, another person had a very interesting experience. Um, she was a nurse that was brought over to draw blood. They were having a blood drive and um, she was shown to a, a room and said this is where you're going to be uh, drawing people's blood for the day and so she busied herself with setting everything up the, need, the way that it needed to be and she had a, one of those surgical trays that was kind of out and her back was turned and suddenly the whole tray with all the needles and the vials and everything it was as if somebody went over to it and hit it it flipped over, everything went everywhere, and there was nobody in the room. Now she got this chill. She knew that she was not alone and she screamed. And one of the other nurses runs in and says, are you okay? And she said something, you know, she explained what had happened and the nurse said, oh, they, did they not tell you the building's haunted? Well, that was, that, was, that was all she needed to hear, right? Now, another thing is people hear vintage music, usually kind of big band music, very soulful music. Uh, emanating from the building, um, sometimes late at night, people that have worked in the building have heard it. Um, this story came to me by a woman that was working there when it was the Red Cross. Everybody had left for the day, and she was by herself, knew that she was by herself in the building, and suddenly she started hearing the music. Well, she was interested. She wasn't so sure that it was supernatural, so she made her way to where the music was playing. She got to the ballroom, probably where you were married, and she saw a little bit of light coming from underneath the door. So she opened it. She looked in. The room was mostly dark except for in the middle. There's a man wearing an old World War II uniform. He's dancing with a woman. She had the feeling that she was interrupting something. They did not look at her. They just kind of trolled around once and then they were gone and then she left feeling a little strange about that situation. She said as soon as they faded, the music stopped as well. Now, who are they? Well, I don't know, but what I will tell you, the history of that building, during World War II, dances were conducted there because this is where soldiers would have said goodbye to their sweethearts. This is where, before they shipped overseas, it would have been one of the last places that they would have spent time. Now, if you go down the road, we have a war memorial, and you will find the names of many men that fought for our freedom, that died on the beaches of Normandy and Anzio and Iwo Jima. We had a lot of people in this town that, that served, 
And so we, we do believe that he was one of the ones that did not come back and perhaps uh, in death that is where they are together because it was where they were together before they said goodbye. So kind of think about that. Um, as we walk away, we do have the lights flicker. Um, it's been a little bit um, kind of off and on the last couple weeks. So if you see just a light turn on in one of the windows and off, just, just let us know. Now I hope you guys had a good time tonight. I don't like to send anybody home without a good bedtime story, so I'm going to go ahead and share one with you. This would have been about over two years ago now. Um, when COVID was going strong, um, most of the tours I was doing in those days were in fact private engagements. Um, I would receive a phone call, usually very frustrated parents that needed to get out of their house with their kids. And so we would have a lot of very fun, very small tours. And um, I uh, led a two husbands and wives, and um, so just a group of four. And um, they were, they had a good time. But when the, uh, the tour was over, um, I asked them if they had any questions. And uh, they said that, you know, we really wanted to experience something. We want to see something. And uh, I said, you know, I just tell the stories, but, um, you know, certainly head over to Founders Park. Maybe you'll see something. And I went home, didn't think anything more of it, but my phone rings at 7 a.m. the next day. Uh, I was kind of getting out of bed and kind of looked at it, so that's interesting. I answered the phone, and uh, it was the husband, and he was very uh, agitated on the phone. Uh, said that he had a problem and he hoped that I could help him with it. And so I said, well, I don't know, but I will listen. And he explained to me that him and his wife and their friends had gone over to Founders Park and they had gotten their phones out and they started taking pictures. They started filming. And after a couple of minutes, they got little orbs of light. Um, they started getting what looked like kind of children running around the ground and uh, very evident, everybody saw it. And uh, then, they, then the giggling started, uh, just little laughter, little, just, you know, it was, they all heard it. And to the point the wife said, that sounds like a little girl. I'd sure like to have a daughter. I don't know why she said that, but when she did, everything stopped just went quiet so they went home not thinking anything of it now they went to bed like they normally did went to sleep around 2 a.m they both wake up sit up in bed they look at each other they're feeling agitated they're feeling like they are not alone and that was when the both of them heard a voice on the other side of the door do you want to come and play with me the doorknob slowly turned. It opened up a crack, and they saw a dark shape come into the room. Now, I asked him, why didn't you jump up and turn the lights on? <laughs> he said, we just sat there not believing what we were seeing. He said it moved in toward the bed, and it sat down, and it kind of moved around as if it was turning to look at them. Well, that was it for him. He jumped up, flipped the lights on, actually went around the entire house turning on all the lights, and they sat there in bed until they called me at 7 a.m. <laughs> not sleeping. Now, this is my favorite part because the comment was, sir, do you think she'll go back? I said, you kind of invited her. <laughs> I never did hear back from them. I don't think they're dead. <laughs> but be very, very careful what you do and what you invite into your home. Um, a lot of people ask me if I know who she is. Um, there is a particular spirit over there of a little girl. Um, she is known to be a little bit of a prankster. Um, I have had people on my tour that have lived around the park. One particular gentleman told me as a little boy he would wake up in the middle of the night and see a little girl in a pink dress in his closet. She would wink at him and then vanish. He said it happened enough times that he started kind of getting more immune to it. But uh, so she, it may be the same spirit that just likes to play tricks, but she's definitely there. So be careful if you do go over there. Maybe you'll get a visit. Uh, with that, that is our tour for tonight. And from Haunted Whittier, I am Jacob. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. On this wonderful, scary hurricane night, right? <laughs> if you had a good time, I'm Jacob. If you did not have a good time, I am Melissa. And this is Haunted <laughs> Orange. Um, again, I want to thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed the stories tonight. 
Um, I like to leave every one of my tours with just a quick quote from the great Sue Grafton. Uh, she wrote horror books and she would say that ghosts do not haunt us. Um, that is not the way it works. They present themselves among us because we cannot let them go. And I do hope that is the case. Let us hold on to our folklore, our ghost stories, and most of all, our history. And with that, you guys have a great night and please drive home safely and be careful in this storm that is approaching. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you so much. All right, guys. So, you know, we couldn't just leave the haunted tour with them talking about Founders Park without coming to Founders Park. But this park closes. It's already closed. I'm a little far from home. I don't want to get in trouble from going to a park at night. But this park was built on top of a cemetery. And Isn't that crazy, Miss? And there's there? bodies still underground. Yeah, they're, they're, they, they did just not move over. up. They did not move any no, bodies. They moved except for between six and eight. Yes, six and eight. Yeah. And that's because families asked for them to be moved. Yep. But people around here will... S yeah. Still... What was that? I heard somebody yelling. What is it?